Thank you very much, uh, Lord Patton, for your for your time uh, and a very short notice. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you follow uh, Hong Kong said development very closely. There were weeks of protests in Hong Kong uh, over the extradition bill, and it seems that there's no sign of an end of it. Um, are you are you surprised? in one way or another, uh, about what happened in Hong Kong in the past few weeks. I'm not surprised by the strength of objections to the extradition bill. Um, I think it was, um, in a way, the straw that broke the camel's back. Or the French would say, the drop of water which broke the vase. Um, I think it was the culmination of a series of concerns about the mainlandization of Hong Kong, um, about Hong Kong seeing its way of life, its freedoms whittled away a bit at a time, and a sense, which may or may not be fair, um, that uh, Carrie Lam was more concerned about her relationship with Beijing and her relationship with people in Hong Kong. Now that may be unfair, but that's certainly what um, people clearly felt. And I think the extradition bill was a, um, a very um, foolish move. Um, you could have dealt with the individual Taiwan case. And let's be clear, 22 years you've managed without an extradition bill. Um, the fact that there wasn't an extradition bill before, before 1997, let alone afterwards, wasn't a, a loophole, it wasn't a mistake, it was deliberate. And back in the early 1990s, it was the Chinese government that wasn't keen on any uh, formal um, agreement on the rendition of fugitives. Um, but leave that on one side, it was clearly a mistake, and I think that... Um, uh, Carrie Lam, the chief executive, understands that. The problem is, and it was very similar um, in the case of the demonstrations in 2014, the problem is, if you always give way a bit too late and not quite enough, it's more difficult to satisfy legitimate grievances. Now, Three or four weeks ago, I wrote saying that I, I wrote an article saying that um, I had no particular axe to grind, that I hoped that calm could be restored as soon as possible, and that I thought that the best way of doing that was to announce that the bill was dropped for good um, and to establish a public inquiry, a committee of inquiry, to consider the demonstrations and the way they'd been policed. Um, and I think that that would have probably been enough to um, uh, make people feel more um, sympathetic to this, to the administration and would have probably meant that um, the demonstrations, at least most of them, finished. But at each stage, a concession seems to have been wrung out of the government at the last moment. And I don't think that um, the communist regime in Beijing has helped. When Ka Carrie Lam, this is my understanding from reading the Hong Kong press, from reading, I think, um, the pro-Beijing communist press, um, China, Hong Kong press, when um, Carrie Lam went up to Shenzhen to talk to Han Zhang, um, the Chinese leaked it, so that it looked as though um, Carrie Lam was simply doing what she was told rather than taking a decision and doing it off her own bat. So w why China had to do that and to undermine her is a, a quite an interesting question, I think. But we are where we are. Now, um, I read a statement uh, made earlier in the week by the former Chief Justice Andrew Lee, who is a very great jurist. He's one of the um, uh, 
greatest lawyers I've ever known and one of the wisest men. And I thought he set out in very sympathetic terms, both to the demonstrators and to Carrie Lamb, a way forward. But it does involve making it clear that the bill is, is not just dead, but buried. And the form of words which Carrie Lamb is using, and the form of words which some of the demonstrators want her to use, there's no difference in meaning really between them. And I think it wouldn't hurt her simply to um, say, I'm not bringing it back, it's over. Secondly, um, he suggested, he made clear, as I would do myself, um, that violence is never acceptable. Now, of course, I understand why people um, felt frustrated. And of course, like others, I would have questions about how it happened. How come that people can spend eight hours breaking into the legislature and then when they get in, there aren't any police there? I mean, it, it at least raises some questions. Mm -hmm. I don't put it, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not suggesting a conspiracy, but it is curious. So, um, the, the arguments for um, an inquiry, which would not undermine the police, it would not undermine anybody, seem to me to be overwhelming. And what is a what, what is a worry, is that because of the element of violence in some of what happened when the legislature was broken into, it's enabled the hardliners in Beijing and in the Hong Kong administration to take attention away from the fact that almost a third of the population of Hong Kong behaved with considerable civility and courtesy in those demonstrations. Now, I was pleased that the other day Carrie Lam distinguished between the overwhelming number of people who had demonstrated peacefully for things they believed in and a small minority, she said, I think she said a very small minority who behaved violently. That's a proper distinction to make. But I think you could, you could settle those arguments with a, with a public committee of a commission of inquiry and nobody should feel they have anything to hide. When I um, reorganised the police service in Northern Ireland, we had 40 public meetings around Northern Ireland with people telling harrowing stories about the violence that they'd been subjected to by the other side. Um, and it became uh, a sort of truth and reconciliation um, process. And I suspect that something like that will need to happen in Hong Kong. Now, I, I would want to make it clear that I'm not giving anybody lectures. I'm not seeking to um, put myself in the position of people who feel so passionately strongly about their future and their city's future. Um, I'm not seeking to um, to uh, undermine anybody. But something which occurred to me from the outset of these discussions was this. I haven't been to Hong Kong since uh, the autumn of 2017. But I came in 2016. And in 2016, um, I made a speech in the Foreign Correspondents Club and then repeated it, saying I would always be in favour of democracy, but I couldn't possibly be in favour of independence for Hong Kong, because I'd negotiated um, with the British government in good faith uh, the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty on the basis of what the Chinese government would now presumably call a historic document the 1898 Treaty, which we have kept. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I said I, I couldn't support um, uh, 
independence, but I would always support greater democracy. And Joshua Wong and some of the other students said to me, would you say the same thing to a room full of students? And I went to Hong Kong University. I was there. <laughs> and I spoke, it was full, do you remember? Yeah. And there were, there were some tough questions and I didn't satisfy everybody. But um, it was a proper dialogue. So I went back in the following year, 13 months later, and the same debate was taking place. But nobody from the government had gone and spoken to the students. So why do you need a former clapped out elderly colonial oppressor to, uh, to make the case um, against democracy? The two major say, advices you gave uh, Apparently, we're not accepted by the governments. I think that still caused the continuing, say, protests in Hong Kong. If if you were Carrie Lam, what you would what, what what would you do now? She made some she made an attempt a few days ago to respond to those demands, but apparently that that didn't help. Um, I think I'd make it even clearer that the bill is not just dead, but um, buried. And I think I would um, establish an open, transparent um, committee of inquiry to look at the demonstrations, um, about the reasons for the demonstrations and about the way they'd been policed. Um, I don't think that while the Police Complaints Commission is a, is a decent body, I don't think it would carry the same weight as a committee of inquiry in which people um, have to make statements under oath um, when uh, they're entitled to legal representation. I don't think it would be undermining the police to do that. I don't think it would be undermining the case for the demonstrators to be doing that, but it would at least try to arrive at um, a a vision of what had happened, which was supported by evidence and which could get the broad support of the community. I didn't think when I watched those demonstrations, um, the millions marching peacefully with people in wheelchairs at the front, with normal families, with businessmen, construction workers, lawyers, legislators, doctors, nurses, all of Hong Kong. I didn't think that that was a political faction or a political party. I thought it was Hong Kong. Mm. And I think that people like that um, would be prepared to accept the idea of a commission of inquiry. I hope others would too. When these things happen, the united front are always the same. <laughs> they wheel out the same language, sort of cultural revolution cliches about foreign interference and about um, my wickedness and the wickedness of others. Um, all that's, all that happens. But they're terribly bad at trying to understand why people have done what they've done. Um, and uh, I think that's ultimately one of, the, one of the fundamental weaknesses of the communist system. So they should try to understand how Hong Kong people can be patriotic, but have a strong commitment to their own citizenship which is, I think, what we've seen. Is it too late now for the for, for Carrie Lam to do anything? No, it's not too late. And, um, look, it's related, re relevant to what I've just said. Um, there's no particular leadership of what's happened. It's been so broad-based. If you had demonstrations in this country and a quarter or a third of the population 
um, were involved. You couldn't say that's the Labour Party or that's the Conservative Party, so we must, we must talk to their leaders. You, you'd know you were talking to the whole community. Um, and I suspect that most people, if, if Carrie Lamb would make an offer like that, which doesn't go very far beyond what she's said already, they'd be prepared to cut her some slack. Um, and I would hope that um, uh, the young leaders of the democracy movement would be prepared to do that as well. Um, uh, the problem which always arises in mass protests and mass demonstrations is that um, those who have led them insofar as they're led at all, those who've been in the forefront of them, let me put it that way, have great difficulty understanding when they've won the argument, have great difficulty in knowing when they should, when they've um, got the moral high ground and when they can um, not, re not surrender, not retreat, but, but move move backwards and give the other side a chance to respond. During the democracy demonstrations, when people like um, Cardinal Zen, Anson Chan, Martin Lee and other democracy leaders were saying to young people, look, you've won, you've won the argument. Now's the time to, to um, uh, step back a bit. They were often attacked as though they were somehow time servers or quizlings. You know, th these are people who spent their whole lives um, arguing and 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 uh, making sacrifices for these sort of principles. So it's not advocating surrender to say that um, uh, it's quite a good idea now to give Carrie Lamb the chance to show that she understands what's been said. But will she be able to, to govern even even if if, if now um, the protesters say will say gradually say um, quiet down? Well I don't know. Um, they obviously worry that whatever happens will be tactical and that as happened with the 2014 demonstrations they'll gradually be picked off with one um, obscure bit of public order legislation used against them after another. To be in a situation where people were being prosecuted five years after the demonstrations in 2014 for what had happened then was, was bizarre and counterproductive. Because what did it do? Um, it may, instead of trying to pull the community together, it looked vengeful, it looked spiteful. And um, if you want to unite a community, you have to, you have to look as though you understand people and as though you are prepared to be generous towards them. So my own view is that um, um, for Carrie, for Carrie Lamb, her greatest strength isn't her relationship with Beijing. It should be her relationship with Hong Kong. Because Beijing will cut her off at the knees once they think she's ceased to be useful. What have they done with her predecessors? With her three predecessors? When they've seemed to have... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, run out of road, they've, they've got rid of them. And um, that's why, that's why it makes much more sense to have a rather more democratic way of electing a leader. When, when Carrie Lamb won, and she's a, she's a very diligent public servant, civil servant, she worked for me, I didn't know her very well, but she worked diligently for me. She was regarded as a, as a clever woman. She was at Hong Kong U. She went to Cambridge. Um, very hard working. 
um, maybe not um, brilliant at politics, but anyway. Um, when she won the leadership, she won it because a large majority of the hand-picked selection committee were told to vote for her, even though her opponent had a huge lead in the opinion polls over her. But he'd made a mistake. What was the mistake? He'd suggested talking to the leaders of the democracy movement. What a terrible sin to talk to your fellow citizens about their aspirations. Mm. But in Beijing, that wasn't a very popular thing to do or say. So I think in order to get people to behave moderately, you have to be prepared to behave moderately yourself. And that means talking to them. If you, if you were the Beijing leadership, do you think Carrie Lam is more a liability now? I, I can't say. I, I don't know what they would. Um, I, I wouldn't um, put myself in in their shoes. What a thought! Perhaps I could become the the um, uh, an extra member of the standing committee of the Politburo. Uh, it would be a remarkable change. Um, I just don't know. I don't understand. So how I, underst I understand. I understood. I think what was happening in China before Xi, Xi Jinping, mm. but I don't understand what's happening now. Um, I think that, um, by and large, um, China and Hong Kong went pretty well until Xi Jinping. I mean, not perfect. But, but pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and now, who knows? In, in, in many democracies, um, you've probably seen a cabinet with shuffle heads rolling uh, to save the leader. Uh, did, they, did they have that, do you think? Well, it's, it's, it's um, <laughs> we're at the moment in no position to preach about good governance to anybody. We're in such a terrible mess in this country. It's the worst political crisis of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's appalling. And some of our behavior, some of the behavior of our political leaders, including in my own party, has been contemptible. And I've never used that word before about, about um, political leaders. Um, so I'm not sure we're in a position to, to um, give lectures, but what is true um, is that there has always been a tendency in politics to for, for leaders to lay down their friends' lives in order to try to save their own, <laughs> to um, get rid of some of their colleagues in order to try to save their own position. Um, it's not a very honourable thing to do. I still think it's very old-fashioned of me, but I still think that honour has a place in, in British politics. Um, and uh, in every politics. And we're, we're, in a, we're in a very difficult position at the moment. I'm an Americaphile. I love America. I can't stand Trump. I think Trump is a danger to the world. Um, I think China is an extraordinary civilization. I don't like the Chinese Communist Party. It doesn't mean I hate China. It doesn't mean that I hate the United States. Um, I think they're both fantastic countries, but I don't like their present leadership. When I was a when I was a when I was um, a European Commissioner, and I'd been in the job for about. Um, six months and we'd started we were negotiating or Pascal Lamy and I were, were negotiating um, or helping to negotiate China's accession to the WTO and I think when you look back to the to the beginning of the century the problems that China faced in terms of debt in terms of um, difficulty in increasing consumption were very similar to the um, problems today, but then there was there were two silver bullets. One was urbanisation, and the other was joining the WTO. Anyway, 
Um, I remember Foreign Minister Tang coming to see me. He was an extremely nice man. And saying at the beginning of a meeting, at this time we must cooperate. And I said, and he laughed, but I wanted to cooperate last time. And then he said, he had a, he had a, he had a page of notes. And he read very formally, he said, um, the Chinese leadership have considered your position. Um, and they've decided you're a force for concord, not discord. And after the meeting, the charge, no, the number two in the Chinese embassy to the EU phoned up my private secretary to make sure he'd taken the words down carefully. So my position hasn't changed. I'm, I'm in favour of greater openness. I'm in favour of international cooperation. I'm in favour of people keeping to, the word, to their word in international treaties, which the Chinese are threatening not to do now over the joint declaration. I haven't changed in any of those ways. Um, I think that um, I don't like uh, tariffs. Um, uh, I don't like trade wars. I think we have, there are arguments with China about investment and trade and joint ventures and intellectual property theft. There are arguments about those things. But, but you actually try to f pursue them through working together with other countries which have the same concerns uh, rather than doing, doing it the way Trump is doing it. And what is the latest thing Trump has done? Apparently, he's told um, President Xi that he's not going to make a fuss about Xinjiang or about Hong Kong, provided China gives some ground on trade talks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's lamentable. This is supposed to be this is supposed to be the the leader of the free world of the alleged free world, mm -hmm. and he behaves like a well, I better not say. <laughs> well, um, in, in in Hong Kong. Uh, to follow what you have just said, uh, yeah. Hong Kong people love Hong Kong, but increasingly they don't like the government, they don't like the leaders, they don't like the systems. Um, there's a very strong feeling of frustration, desperation, despair in the society. You probably read about reports of suspected suicides. Yes, I have. Probably attributed to the kind of depression caused by the protests. What would you say to the Hong Kong people uh, who seems to feel so frustrated? Okay. I was, um, I'll tell you a story. I was having a, um, I was walking um, in Richmond Park a few weeks ago with um, a friend of mine from Rome who's a bishop, an Irishman. Wonderful man. And um, uh, my friend um, and I, during our walk, we suddenly met four young Hong Kong Chinese students. One of them said to me, do you remember me? Um, Bang Ting Hong, do you remember? I'm at Oxford, he said, I'm a postgraduate student. He's doing, he's doing, he's a medic, he's a medic. I think he's working on diabetes. I think what, it's, an, it's an illness like this. He said, I have my photograph taken with you, holding a yellow umbrella. I said, well, a lot of people had photographs holding yellow umbrellas, including a lot from the mainland. So he said, let me introduce you to my friends. And he introduced me to his friends, including his girlfriend. And she started talking about um, Hong Kong, and she broke down in tears, and she said, uh, what should we do? Do you think we should emigrate? What can I say that reassures people? And it's happened to me more than once. What I say is, I think Hong Kong is special because you have the sort of views that you do have and because you're prepared to stand up for them. Hong Kong is one of the greatest cities in the world. Uh, it's where I learnt the most important political lessons I've learnt about the relationship between economic and political freedom. And that's in the sort of DNA of people in Hong Kong. So I tried to say, I think you should continue to, to make Hong Kong special 
I'm not sure whether I convinced her or not. But it's a question I get a lot. And I get a question, a lot of people asking me um, what the rest of the world will do about Hong Kong. Um, and I hope what I say is true, but I wrote a piece in the Financial Times, which I sent you last week, yeah. saying that I hoped we hadn't lost our sense of obligation and our sense of honour. But it's, it's difficult, I realise that. Hong Kong is a very, very special place. Um, it's not perfect. There are, I know, there are, I know, big social problems. Um, housing. Um, but by and large, um, it's a good and decent place. I, I, get, I used to get very cross when um, people in Singapore used to suggest that uh, Singapore was much better than Hong Kong. Um, I used to point out, and this is relevant to what we were saying about policing, I used to point out that if you looked at the Interpol figures in Hong Kong, there was less crime in Hong Kong than in Singapore. We didn't cane people or execute them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to point out that most of the academic research um, on Singapore and Hong Kong suggested that business returns on investment are much greater in Hong Kong than Singapore. It doesn't mean that Singapore isn't um, a huge success story. It's a success story for social engineering, which I don't much like. You know, people used to say, what's your industrial policy? And I would say, we don't have an industrial policy. We invest in infrastructure and education and public health and let people get on with life. And I still think that is, what, that is what Hong Kong has to offer. And that's why you find so many young people from other countries want to work in Hong Kong rather than in Singapore. And then what happens is they get older and they, get, well, they have wives and children and they think oh, Singapore looks a bit safer and they can have a garden and so on. But Hong Kong is still a very, very special place, and um, I hope it can stay like that. Um, the, the, the civil service in Hong Kong, I don't know what it's like now, but when I was there, it was fantastic. And some of the people I keep in touch with are who were formerly my civil servants and were absolutely terrific first class, with a real sense of um, public duty. But are you worried that um, this time, like 2003, the 50, well, half a million people march, the 2014, the umbrella movement, after that, China tightened even further its control over Hong Kong? Tried, tried, it didn't do it very much after 2003, just a bit. But it did after 2014. I think 2014 spooked President Xi. Mm -hmm. But will, will they happen again this time? I hope not. How many times... Um, how many times did it take for China to learn? This is supposed to be a, a great... It is a great civilization. How many times does it have to learn um, that if you touch the stove and leave your hand on the stove for too long, you get burned? So I hope that they'll learn, because the Chinese are historically extremely good at everything except governing themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you now more doubtful about one country of assistance in Hong Kong? Well, I'm, what I'm doubtful about is um, the Chinese commitment to one country, two systems. When you have people like the Chinese ambassador here, who's, he must have been um, absent the day they did diplomacy um, in the foreign policy school. He's an extraordinary man. When you have him denouncing the joint declaration, saying it doesn't apply after 1997, it's a historical document. As I've said, what would the Chinese government have said if we'd said the 1898 agreement was a historical document and we weren't taking any notice of it. The Joint Declaration is an international treaty with obligations on both sides. 
and we have absolutely every right to uh, talk to China about what's happening in Hong Kong and talk to others about what's happening in Hong Kong. So what I, what I feel is that if, um, if China wants people to trust it, then it's not a very good start to say, um, well, look at what we're doing in Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, if they're breaking their word and saying it doesn't matter that we signed an international treaty, then uh, what do we believe them on? So um, I'm worried about that. I'm not. I'm not worried that people in Hong Kong will will um, themselves cease to believe in one country, two systems. It was a brilliant formula, and you and I both know that it was actually designed principally for Taiwan, not for Hong Kong. And if you want the unification of, of China, including Taiwan. What sort of signal does it send if you're plainly undermining M1 country two systems in Hong Kong? The, Chi the Taiwanese, as you know, I don't agree with it, but the Taiwanese keep account of all the times they think that the joint declaration has been infringed. Um, it was in the 70s or 80s last time I looked. Um, so they keep an eye on what's happening. Mm -hmm. You, you said it's important for the international world to closely watching Hong Kong, but speaking out. But the Chinese government, at least publicly, they don't like it. And, uh, no, they don't. And, 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 but, and, if, and, but, if, if, but if you're dealt with, if, if you, I started that article in the Sunday, yeah. in the Financial mm -hmm. Times, by referring to um, Tony Abbott's remark that um, uh, policy it was driven in some countries by fear and greed. <laughs> um, if you allow Chinese China to bully you, you can't be surprised if it goes on bullying you. And for what? Mm -hmm. We're not going to do more trade with China because we kowtow. If the Chinese want to buy our things, they will. Um, if they want to invest in, in Britain, they will because they make a return. Why, do, why are there 1,350 Chinese students at Oxford? 1,150 of them, no, 1,100 of them, perhaps more, from the mainland. Why are, they two, why are there 240 um, professors and lecturers and researchers from China in uh, Oxford? Not because um, the Chancellor of the University has kowtowed, but because it's a great university. And it's, we're delighted to have so many. But if there weren't as many Chinese, we'd probably have more Indians. Because uh, there's always a theory in Hong Kong that says that uh, if you got foreign involvement in, say, foreign influence, it will become productive. It will make things worse in Hong Kong. I guess they will even cite the recent uh, distribution bill thing that because the international community has, I think, for the first time, made very strong comments and uh, made the Chinese government even more unwilling. Yeah, well, well, they, they still say as well that if only the rest of the world didn't talk about Xinjiang, um, they'd be frightfully nice to um, all the all the Uyghurs. They wouldn't have a million of them locked up. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't have raised um, Muslim um, mosques to the ground. Um, they wouldn't be dividing children from their from their parents. They wouldn't be um, uh, installing the most extraordinary surveillance equipment on everybody's on every Uyghur's um, phone. Um, you know, they do these things because they think they can get away with them, and it's it's absolutely imperative that when they do things which other people disagree with, they're called out. Mm -hmm. It's not being anti-Chinese, it's being opposed to the lack of moral values of the Communist Party of China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, we know the, the recent protests are still um, going on, but, but judging from what we've seen so far, um, is, it a, is, it a, is, it a, is it something that ultimately will uh, come out, say, in the process of one country, two systems? There's a strong feeling in Hong Kong that uh, it seems that there is in the midpoint of 50 years, close to midpoint, but, but it seems that we are at a very important juncture. There's 28 years just yet to, yet, yet to go. Who knows? 
Will will President Xi Jinping be still President of China in 28 years? Where will any of us be in? You know, I don't know where we'll where in this country we'll be in 24 hours now, <laughs> let alone 28 years. And, and what about the rest of the world? There is that Chinese, there is that thing which people call the Chinese curse, which nobody can trace to the Chinese language. May you live in interesting times. The Chinese curse. You know, the point being, it's an example of political irony, that interesting times are always, always dangerous. Um, in fact, it wasn't said by anybody Chinese, not from Confucius, the Confucian Analects or whatever. I think it was first said by a British Prime Minister called Joe Chamberlain, who was the father of, um, he was a great figure, he wasn't the Prime Minister, he was a great figure in, in, in imperialism. I don't like him. Um, but interesting times um, are unpredictable, unstable, uncoordinated, and they invariably lead to um, to trouble. I mean, like Iran and the and the Gulf of Hormuz at the moment, um, like what's happening in in uh, uh, Sudan. Um, President Trump gives all his support to Saudi Arabia and the Sunnis, who are busy causing trouble in Yemen and Sudan and probably Libya, and blames everything that goes wrong on the Iranians. My own view is that both sides are culpable of having done some bad things, but we had with the Iranians a very, very good nuclear deal, which the Iranians had kept to, and then President Trump walked away from it. You know, um, is President Trump, does President Trump, is he predictable? If if you were if you if you were Liu He, um, formerly the special envoy for President Xi Jinping to these um, talks, but apparently demoted because he produced a deal which President Xi Jinping didn't like. If you were him, how would you try to gauge what President Trump was going to do next? So, twenty eight years with President Trump 28 minutes. What's he tweeting this morning? What you can depend on is it'll be badly spelt. Mm -hmm. I guess Hong Kong people won't be able to think about what happened in French East now, yeah, but, but even in the next coming months or so, um, do, do we have to now get used to live in uncertain times? Uh, that would be the advice for Hong Kong people, I mean. Well, I, my own hope is the time has become a bit less uncertain. But that means that we return to a belief in an international rule book, into international cooperation, into international jurisdiction, the acceptance of international jurisdiction. What it means is that we accept, once again, a, a world in which People understand that most of the problems faced by individual societies are best dealt with by cooperating with other countries. How can you deal with issues like the arms trade or drugs or public health without cooperating with others? So um, um, I hope that um, those rather old-fashioned views will, um, uh, will be understood again one day soon. Um, anyway, that, I think I, I think that's going to be my best next book. Um, I'm trying to think of what to write next, and I think that's um, what I'll write about next. Um, all right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank so, you very thank much. You very much. Have a good have a good trip back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.